Voltron Legendary Defender is another show that makes me love Netflix and the team behind Avatar The Last Airbender even more than I already did. The animation is slick, the characters have depth, and it has dethroned Symbionic Titan as the American cartoon that both gets and replicates the best parts of Super Robot anime. This series is surging in popularity, but I'm still sort of shocked that most of the younger fans I've met don't know that Legendary Defender isn't just a remake, but it's sort of a double remake. So instead of being an elitist dickhead to you for not watching a cartoon from the 80s, I'm doing this partly to catch up fans on the somewhat convoluted history of Voltron, and also to see if I can make some predictions about the upcoming second season of Legendary Defender. But let's take a look at the series' roots first, and you can see where I'm drawing these conclusions from. In the mid-1980s, cartoons to sell toys were the biggest thing on the block here in the US, and cartoons to sell robots with a gimmick were especially big after Hasbro's wildly successful release of the Transformers. Now Transformers was odd because while the toys were imported Japanese toys, there wasn't a pre-existing cartoon or even a storyline. So Hasbro had an American team write the stories and outsource the animation to Sunbow Animation in Korea and Toei in Japan. Obviously this was very successful but making a new cartoon is super expensive, and it wasn't long before someone noticed it would be easier to sell toys if the cartoon already existed. So let's go to Japan. Plenty of anime had been brought to the US before this point, but this was the beginning of the United States giant robot boom, while Japan had been experiencing this since the late 70s. This meant Japan was full of mecha anime, with lots of toys right for the taking. This meant that while some really popular robots like Motzinger Z and Macross got adapted for American audiences, it also meant series that were never very well liked in Japan would finally find an audience. And we're going to focus on the one that would become the first season of Voltron. Beast King Go Lion. Go Lion is a pretty standard super robot anime. There's a team of five using the Gachamon template. That's the burnout leader, the stuck up loner, the girl, the fat guy, and the little kid. Oh, and we'll get back to that, I promise. They use smaller lion robots that combine into a larger humanoid robot to fight a new monster every week. While the Voltron toy was certainly fun, it wasn't a very unique idea for a robot toy in Japan. Really, the only thing that set this show apart from any of the other shows was just how insanely violent it was. People were killed in gladiator matches, there are some acts of cannibalism. Uh, shortly before the show even starts, the Galra Empire wipes out the entire Earth. Oh, and yeah, this show was definitely meant for kids. So. While Go Lion was pretty standard for Japanese audiences, World Events Productions saw potential in it for American audiences, both because of its interesting cartoon and because of the awesome toy related to it. And so, the first season of Voltron Defender of the Universe became a thing. <laughs> Great job, Nick. All that talk and you only just now got to Voltron. Which means we can skip back to the present. The biggest differences between Legendary Defender and the two shows it's based on is that Legendary Defender is actually as good as nostalgic people my age and older wish the original Voltron was. But this isn't to say that it doesn't draw a lot from the original series. On the contrary, Legendary Defender uses terms both from Voltron and Go Lion. Uh, most of the tech uses the Americanized names. Things like the Castle of Lions, Robies, and of course Voltron itself. But the alien races, on the other hand? Those use the Go Lion names. The Galra Empire were the forces of Planet Doom in the original, 
while Planet Altea became Planet Eris. It's in the characters that we see some of the more interesting changes, though. And not just the major twist on Pidge's biological sex, though I'm a huge fan of that change. Most of the characters use their Americanized Voltron names, except for one very noteworthy exception, Shiro. Technically, there's no character named Shiro in either of the original shows. Voltron has a fifth pilot in black named Sven, who in Go Lion was named Takashi Shirogane, so it's probably safe to assume that's where the name came from. And from Shiro, we get a great jumping off point to where Legendary Defender might be going in the near future. Now in Go Lion, Takashi Shirogane isn't the leader. He's not even the pilot of the Black Lion, despite his uniform color. As the Blue Lion pilot, he's basically the Kamina of the group. In a show full of shallow characters, Takashi's defining trait is being the guy who died. The guy who died to inspire the team to get together, yes, but that's still really his one thing. Sven got off a little better in Voltron, since in Go Lion, Takashi has a brother, Ryo Shirogane. The American writers just decided to have the characters say that Sven went to a hospital planet, and that the brother was actually the same guy. Although in Go Lion, Ryo also sacrificed himself to defeat the Galra Empire. So what does this mean for Shiro? Well, it could mean nothing. These are good writers, I wouldn't put it past them to troll old fans like me, holding my breath waiting for Shiro's next wrong step. That's how I spent most of the first season, actually. He even has a one-on-one -on -one with the Witch Hagar, which is what ki sent Sven to the hospital planet. But I can't help but think poor Shiro is destined to die. Firstly, he's not just the leader. He's the only character everyone respects. Saving him is literally what brings the other four paladins together. He's the only one no one bickers with. He's the only one Pidge opened up to. He's the only one Keith aspires to be. Alora and Koran don't even talk down to him the way they do with the others. And be by mecha anime tropes, that doesn't spell great things for him. The older brother dying is a tried and true anime trope. Making the most likable character die to force the rest of the characters to grow up fast hurts hard, but it also works really well. I brought up Kamina from Gurren Lagann for a reason earlier, and it's not just because of this trope. Like, let's look at Keith, who idolizes Shiro and wants to be just like him. When he first uses Voltron's flaming sword, the art mimics a scene of in Gurren Lagann, when Simone, another young character aspiring to be like his older brother figure, first uses his drill attack. When Kamina dies in Gurren Lagann, it not only forces the team to overcome the trauma that almost breaks them all, but for Simone, it forces him not only to be the number one pilot, but also into a leadership role that takes the team to their greatest heights. Could the same happen for the team, and especially Keith, who was both leader and Black Lion pilot in the two original shows? And before you think I'm overthinking this or taking this too far, you should know Gurren Lagann isn't the only show they reference that uses the brother who tragically dies trope. In the first episode, there's a little cameo when Lance, Hunk, and Pidge are sneaking out of the Galaxy Garrison base. See that guy right there? That's unmistakably Roy Foker, the older brother figure from Macross. The granddaddy of characters who fell victim to this trope. For most American anime fans in the 80s, that was the first time they were exposed to that trope. The rest could just be restoring the status quo from the original series. Keith looking up to Shiro, and in serious need of the ability to look before leaping, would be forced to step up and become a leader. 
Keith wouldn't be able to keep leaping into danger, leaving the ace spot open, and since we've seen from the first episode, Lance really wants to be like Keith, so that would be his opening. Let's also talk about Power Rangers Syndrome. While in Go Lion, the pilot's uniforms and casual clothes don't always match with their lions, Legendary Defender seems to enjoy making everyone match. I'm not sure how well this is going to work, since the bond with the lions in the new series is played more like a psychic mystic kind of thing, and not just driving a robot, and it's also true that Lance only has eyes for the blue lion. But on the other hand, Keith wears an awful lot of black. And while he always has that, lead, that black shirt, a leader at heart, he takes the red coat off quite a bit. The Red Lion didn't even react to him the first time they met. It took till he was in actual danger. Similarly, as soon as Zarkon took control of his Bayard again, Black Lion stopped listening to Shiro. An opening? Maybe. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Last but not least though, the original show filled the void left by the dead Sven or Shirogane with Princess Allura. She gets to step up and become the pilot of the Blue Lion. And uh, we've already seen that this version of Allura is more than willing to put herself on the line when it comes to stopping the Galra. And she's wearing an awful lot of blue. So what do you think? Does history condemn Shiro to become hashtag Voltron Kamina? Or am I stretching? Feel free to let me know in the comments, and if you li like what I'm doing, please subscribe for more videos of geekery, and consider supporting my Patreon, which I will link to below. Till next time, this is Nikizumi saying, keep on spockin' in the free world.